So welcome to NCA Chats with me, Chris Hill. And as you can see, I'm joined by NCA Chairman John Inverdale, just to provide our clubs, players, everybody associated with National 1 and National 2, a bit of an update of where we stand going forward as we have now exited the winter. Spring is very much here and hopefully there is light at the end of the tunnel as well. But first of all, John, thanks for joining us again, as always. Great to catch up. It feels like a while since we've last spoken. So uh, how have things been with you during this latest lockdown? Uh, well, long. I mean, I think with every lockdown, they seem to get longer and seem to expand. But obviously, I think the Six Nations has provided a, a welcome lift for everybody involved in rugby over the last few weeks. And there have been some fascinating games and obviously lots of controversy and lots of things to talk about. Um, and who knows, I, I suspect there's still quite a few interesting twists and turns uh, to come before the end. I just, the, the big regret, I mean, you know, the, the, obviously the Wales-England game, the Wales-Scotland game, you know, we're just crying out for spectators mm. to have been at those games because the atmosphere would have been extraordinary. And obviously, I, I think 99.999% certain there won't be. I mean, this entire Six Nations will end and not a single spectator will have actually been in the ground, which is going to be terrible, really. But, but that's just the nature of the beast. Um, you know, you mentioned light at the end of the tunnel. I think there is. I mean, there obviously is light at the end of the tunnel. And I hope from the NCA club's point of view that some may decide to get up and running, you know, before the summer. And some may decide that actually it's best just to sort of just to entrench and be ready for September. Yeah, yeah. I, I did watch the uh, Wales Ireland game you're at, John. It did seem very surreal seeing an empty Cardiff on a Sunday afternoon and the opening weekend of the Six Nations. Yeah, well, I, I, I actually walked down St Mary Street. I've got some, some pictures I took. Um, I was the only person on an on, on a international morning on St Mary Street at two and a half hours before kickoff. And I, I just thought this is just, you know, I mean, the first international I went to in Cardiff was in 1973. So it's long, you know, a long 50 years nearly of, of it being the place to be on international day. And it was just, it was genuinely extraordinary. Um, and uh, there was a cameraman, not a cameraman, there was a photographer from the Western Mail newspaper who was walking around the streets, just taking pictures of anything. And he just came up to me and said, oh, thank God, <laughs> a, hum a human being, I can take a picture. So <laughs> anyway, but yeah, it's, you know, stra strange days, but uh, m maybe, maybe more normal days are, are not too far away. Yeah, I mean, myself and John could talk about the Six Nations for half an hour, but we're not going to do that. We're going to focus purely on the NCA clubs there. And as John said, hopefully a few of our clubs will be back in action uh, before the summer months or leading into the summer months with some local friendlies. But John, I know you had an executive meeting on, on Monday, I believe, at the start of the month. So can you give us any idea of the plans moving forward? I know dates and this can change and this is a fluid situation. But is any sort of updates you can give our clubs planning into the hopefully the 2021-2022 season? Well, this is pretty definitive now, assuming there's obviously not a huge upswing in, in the coronavirus for, um, across the country. But 29th of March, contact training without scrums and malls can resume. So, you know, three weeks time or so, people can actually, the rugby clubs can be alive again, which is the key thing, really. You know, we just desperately want to inject some dynamism and vitality into those moribund buildings and pitches. 26th of April, matches with adapted laws can be played those those dates are are set in stone right. the next two the next two are have sort of semi uh, brackets around them 17th of may it's anticipated that that's when step three of the government roadmap comes into force and what that means is from the 17th of may onwards we should be able to resume full contact training and then 31st of may so that's a bank holiday monday full contact matches could be able to be staged for the first time. So actually that's an opportune day in many ways for a lot of clubs. I don't know if anybody's planned anything at the moment for that, that Monday, but you know, you could imagine a glorious early summer's day, you know, a packed rugby club, loads of people there, money over the bar, et cetera, et cetera, and a sense of a new dawn breaking. So those are, those are the dates that, I mean, those last two dates are dependent on what happens with the virus but you know i think you can you can kind of put them in if not in ink you can put them in in biro if you see what i mean yeah um and then if all things go according to plan all restrictions will be lifted on june the 21st and that then means obviously that again if nothing happens untoward in the, in the intervening period 
when we get to July pre-season training and we're often running into September. The one caveat I would have on all that though, and this is not being, this is not being glass half full, I think it's just being realistic, is just to say that obviously we hope that come September next season we'll just run as one would normally expect. But it, it, it would be naive, I think, to say definitively that we might not have one or two stop-start moments next year when, you know, if there was a sudden spike in cases in November as, as winter kicked in, we might have to stop for two or three weeks or whatever. I mean, it's impossible to say, but, you know, all things being equal, I would hope that all, all of our clubs, all our member clubs, will be up and running in, in July and, and set to go from that first weekend in September. Definitely, John. And we, we've, we have seen it definitely over the last few weeks that some clubs are putting in plans to potentially do local friendlies and they may, as you say, that may, they may take place now on that May bank holiday. But it's been great to see them being proactive and wanting to get out there and wanting to uh, play again because we would have been probably towards the end of the NCAA Cup competition now if everything had gone to plan, building up towards the finals and that excitement would have been generated. But I even yeah. think from, from perspective now, that local friendlies will still generate the same excitement because teams are just desperate to get back playing again. I, I agree with you. And I tell you what, I'm real, if there is, in a, in a year when it's very hard to find many positives, one big positive has been a lot of clubs have done a lot of work on facilities. You know, we've had grandstands going up, floodlights being installed. I mean, certainly just, just decorative work. You know, people who have been volunteering to get down and say, I'll clean this up, I'll sort that out. And, um, and loads of clubs have, have told us how, you know, when they, when they do return to action, people will look around and go, blimey, you know, you know somebody's been around here with, a, with a, <laughs> a, a mop on a big scale, you know. So, so I think people have not, been, have, have not been just sitting, waiting for the end, the end of, of whatever. They've been actually saying, right, OK, let's use this time positively to actually look better at the end of it. And so hopefully on that, on that first Saturday in September, a lot of people, visitors, will go to clubs that they've been familiar with in days gone by and just looked around and gone, God, you've, you've done a lot of work here, haven't you? Um, so, you know, every cloud having a silver lining and all that sort of stuff. Yeah. And, and having a positive impact in terms of clubs as well, John, has been quite evident to see. We know it's been incredibly difficult, but some of the community efforts as well, from, you know, I think Hinkley did over uh, February half term. They produced 500 meals a week for their local community. You know, Leeds Tykes have, have been doing some great work and so many clubs, I don't want to just highlight those two, but there's so many clubs across the National League who have done great work. So even in difficult periods for themselves, we're still seeing these clubs not only work on their own grounds and their own facilities, but also reaching out to others who need it most. Yeah, and, and, and I, I think the key thing about the community which is a word I, I, I think gets bandied about a bit too readily. But the, the community element of rugby has been very has been to the fore over the last year, uh, which, is, which has been tremendous. And, it's that, and that's why it's imperative, though, for the community element within the clubs now to be reborn, if you like, as the, as the spring goes into the summer. And, and suddenly all the volunteers who, who've been missing out on going down to the rugby club to help out, to get them coming back, and just to get people in the habit of, you know, when I think when the fixtures are published mm. in May, I suspect we'll do it probably earlier than normal this year because there's no reason not to. Um, just the anticipation. I think one key thing, one key thing I really hope happens, and if people don't do it on a regular basis, I honestly would encourage them to do it because it's such a rewarding thing to do. I hope that the lack of rugby over the last 12, 15 months will encourage a lot of spectators to go to away fixtures, which they've never done before. You know, if you've never been to Tynedale, or you've never been to Fylde, or you've never been to Canterbury, or you've never been to Redruth, ticking off geographically, you know, <laughs> go, just go, go for the weekend and just in, go and support your team, whoever your team might be as they go, and just, just savour what the NCAA rugby world is, is like, if you like. And, and, and you know, it's, there's a big world out there. It doesn't have to just be at the end of your, your you know, clubhouse perimeter fence. It, it really is. A, uh, there's some fantastic places to go, great parts of the country that you can see. And rugby can, can, in that instance, can really just broaden your mind as well. And maybe, you know, having been starved of it for the last year or so, next year is the time to gorge yourself every week I'm going to Darlington, I'm going to Plymouth, and all points <laughs> north, south, east and west. 
Yeah, there'll be some interesting alarms set there, John, 3 a.m. in the morning, getting on the bus for some of those trips. But as John quite rightly says, it's very much worth it because they've missed out on those long bus journeys up and down the country over the last 12 months. And with all of these decisions as well, John, that you guys have taken uh, over the last year, player welfare has been at the heart of it. And I know player welfare will continue to, to be at the top of the agenda for 21-22 as well. And I know uh, the NCA are planning some measures around that. Well, I mean, clubs should have been told, or they will, or if they haven't been told, they will be told very shortly, about sort of minimum standards for medical provision that we are looking to introduce over the course of the next 18 months. But I think more importantly than that, there is just, and this is stating the obvious, but that sometimes you need to state the obvious. When players get back into training, especially the lower 15s actually, not so much the first 15s, you know, a lot of them are basically, they've had 18 months out of the game and there are going to be a lot of groin strains pulled and a lot of this, that and the others and injuries that are going to be sustained by the very nature of just having not played the game. So, I mean, I, I mean I'm sure this is a real grandmothers and eggs, but I think it's very important for all clubs to be thinking about their medical provision for starting in, in the summer and moving into next season, because by the very nature of, of the inactivity of a lot of players, you know, that they, they won't be perhaps in, in such good physical condition as they might have been had the normality of just playing, you know, week in, week out, have, have kept up their fitness levels. So I, th I, th I think it's obvious, but I think it's worth saying at the same time. Mm, absolutely, absolutely, John. And hopefully uh, the silver lining, as you mentioned there, will allow these players to build up their fitness correctly and, and work into those timescales you mentioned at the start. And hopefully, fingers crossed, by September the 1st, we are back to normality. We have a full uh, board of fixtures to look forward to on the opening yeah. weekend of the season as well, John. Well, John, those are the, the updates that I think everybody was probably after at the moment, but we will continue to update you on the NCA website with anything that, that comes across over the, the next couple of months or so. But John, it's been fantastic to chat to you and catch up with you. Great, Chris. Thanks an awful lot. And as I said there, we will keep everyone uh, updated on the NCA website. And fingers crossed soon, you'll be back down at your clubhouse with a pint in hand and supporting your local team. But thanks to John, and that has been another episode of NCA Rugby Chats.